Welcome to the podcast, Realty Bites, conversations on real estate and lifestyle. I'm your host, Evelyn Lopez. Each week we examine a different topic on real estate or lifestyle. And this week we are speaking on real estate and more specifically about the self-employed individual and mortgages. Being self-employed comes with many benefits, but it also requires a different approach in terms of financing and mortgages compared to the traditional employed worker. In this podcast, we'll be discussing the pros and cons of operating as a sole proprietor versus incorporating your business and how this decision can impact your ability to obtain a mortgage and secure financing. Our guest today is Kyle Cole. He's a mortgage specialist with BMO, which is the Bank of Montreal. Kyle will be shedding some light on the unique challenges and opportunities faced by self-employed individuals when it comes to buying a house. Our goal today is to help self-employed individuals understand the nuances of mortgage applications and to provide them with some practical advice on how to navigate the system effectively. We'll be discussing everything from the documentation required to demonstrate your income to the importance of building a strong credit history as a self-employed borrower. Whether you're a seasoned entrepreneur or just starting out on your self-employment journey, this podcast is for you. So join us as we dive into the world of self-employment and mortgages and discover how you can turn your entrepreneurial spirit into the keys for your dream home. Let's welcome our expert guest, Kyle, as he shares his insights and experiences in the field of self-employment and mortgage financing. And he'll provide you with the knowledge and more important, the tools that you need to know to make informed decisions and ultimately achieve your home ownership goals. So welcome, Kyle. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you for having me, Evelyn. Really excited to be here. Okay. Before we start, maybe you can tell our listeners a little bit about yourself. Yes, of course. So I'm a mortgage specialist with Bank of Montreal Mobile. So working anywhere in the GTA, really anywhere in Canada that you do need a mortgage. Uh, Been with the Bank of Montreal for about six to seven years now, focusing primarily on mortgages for five, uh, really helping clients understand what needs to be done in order to get a mortgage uh, and to walk you through the whole process from start to finish in a seamless manner. Okay, great. So in today's environment, and I think, you know, even after uh, COVID and everything that we went through, a lot of people began working, I think, for themselves as a a self-employed individual. And like everybody else, they too want to be able to have that dream of home ownership. Maybe you can sort of start off by letting us know what the bank considers as a self-employed individual. Yes, absolutely. So self-employment, there is a wide range of self-employment. So the main two that we take a look at is uh, sole proprietorship and then also self-employed underneath your own corporation. So in terms of the the increase in self-employment, we've noticed that, like you mentioned, when COVID hit, a lot of people got laid off on their jobs, unfortunately. Uh, so we did notice that a big uptake in own in clients opening up their own business, whether it's a sole proprietorship or in a corporation, really depends on the type of business. Okay, so how does a sole proprietorship differ? from a incorporated business. Right, so a sole proprietor is essentially a business structure where an individual owns and operates a business as their own self. So as a sole proprietor, you take responsibility for all aspects of the business, including profits, losses, any legal or financial liabilities that may, that may arise. So essentially sole proprietor is you're working for yourself, you claim taxes all under your own name, your income is all on your own. So Great examples are some realtors like yourself, Evelyn, might be either sole proprietor or incorporated, which we'll touch upon in a bit. Other examples are barbers. Perfect example. They own and operate all under their own name uh, and and claim taxes accordingly. Uh, And even clients that might open up like their little their own small little uh, business in terms of maybe selling products like candles or or uh, or clothing lines, stuff like that. Okay. And then what would be an incorporated business? 
So incorporations can be many different things. Uh, the, the one example I like to touch upon is franchises. So maybe a, a client owns uh, multiple McDonald's or multiple Tim Hortons. It's more for up, up a little bit more on the higher scale of things where you might have a lot of employees working for you. Uh, you might have a lot of different business expenses to write off. Okay. And so you said the sole proprietor is the business is under their name. Uh, I guess they're paying people out with their own checks under their own personal name. They're trading in their own name. So are the banks able to fund mortgages for these types of individuals? Yes, absolutely. So what the banks essentially look for is consistency. They want to see a two-year average generally on you doing your own thing and, and showing that you are able to up uh, upkeep with your own self-employment. So a two-year average and specifically the documents is your personal income tax returns. They want to show that you're claiming your taxes accordingly along with your notice of assessments. Okay. So that would be similar to just a person working for somebody. They're filing yeah. their taxes personally under their own name. So everything yes, in their business. as their own individual. Okay. Yes. And they're looking for two years. Now, what about if somebody was working for a company and then they were doing, let's just say they were working for a haircutting salon and now they decide I'm going to go and do this on my own. I'm going to work it in my house or my basement or a little storefront, but I'm going to do it on my own. So I've been a hairdresser for years yes. But now I'm going to do it on my own. Are they still looking for that two years? Yes and no. So this is where exceptions are always, there's always gray area and exceptions are to be made in certain circumstances. So going over the, the, the barber type, for example, you know, there are situations where, you know, one person might work for, for a company specifically, they get their paycheck every week, they get their pay stub, they get their T4 at the end of the year and everything's good. Now, when it comes to uh, being on your own in self-employment, we can kind of take that into consideration depending on the type of business. But this is where there, there's the exception that needs to be made to show consistency. And Barber, for example, you're going from a company that's paying you no matter what on a week by week or bi-weekly basis to doing it fully on your own. To show that consistency, to show that you have that clientele, uh, to regularly bring in business year over year, that's mainly what they're looking for. So in a type of business like that, we may be able to get by with a one-year history, potentially maybe one and a half year to show the consistency, uh, but that would really be a case-by-case -case basis. Right. So if you just went into business on your own, it's going to be extremely hard to get financing if you've only been doing it for a couple of months. Correct. Absolutely. Yes. Okay. Now, when the bank is looking at their income of this individual, are they looking at this individual's personal income or the income that's brought in by the business? So is it, so I guess what I'm getting at, is it the income that's brought by the business before deductions or is it the income less deductions? Now this is what I'm paying myself. Right. So they generally look at a net income. So after everything's paid, uh, but they do gross it up is what we call it at the bank end. So we do add a little bit on as like a generalization to take into account for expenses and business expenses over time. So we do take a look at the net amount, but we do increase it a little bit based on our guidelines. And so this is, I guess, where it becomes that little gray area, a little bit tricky. So a lot of people that have their own business, they're writing off a lot of things because they're wanting to bring their personal income as low as possible. So they're not paying taxes. But of then course. of course, now they're coming into a situation where they come to you and they say, yeah, but I make this much money, but I'm only claiming yeah. this much money. So maybe you can talk about how um, our listeners should look at that when, when they're they're doing their taxes. Of course. And, and this is a very hot topic. So from experience, there have been situations exactly like you mentioned where clients come and, and they show a certain amount. Again, this is all under sole proprietorship. They show a certain amount, although they get paid maybe cash on the side and stuff like that, that they don't fully claim. Kind of like a barber where they get tips, but they don't necessarily claim it. So this is where it can make it very, very difficult in terms of getting approved because the way that 
we look at it there is we need to show the claimed income. So whatever amount you are claiming specifically on your income tax returns, only are we, we can only use those specific amounts to help you get approved. So there's kind of a benefit on both ends where you know, you're getting cash, you're not paying taxes on it. Maybe that could help supplement your down payment. But on the other end is getting approved. The income is very minimal because you're not claiming the full amount. So it might affect the mortgage approval number specifically. Okay. And in terms of qualification for a mortgage on a self-employed individual, what is the down payment requirements? Is it the same as everybody else? Different? More or less? Absolutely. Yeah, it's it's always going to be the same. It's just the way we take a look at the income and the income numbers, that part will be different. So that's where the, the two years of consistency will come into play. So now let's move over to an incorporated business. So maybe we can start by saying uh, what a definition is of an incorporated business. Yeah, of course. So incorporation is essentially the process of creating a separate legal entity known as a corporation that is distinct from their owners. So the business structure can offer a wide range of benefits, including limited liability protection for the owners, as well as the ability to raise capital through the sales of stocks or shares. A corporation is typically managed by a board of directors who are elected by shareholders. That's more on the higher end of things. There are corporations which are smaller, which is just maybe you as the main director, where you can kind of use all your expenses and keep everything within the business and keep it kind of apart from your own personal side of things. Okay. So in the instance of an incorporation, what is the bank looking for in terms of financing for a mortgage? Yeah. So same thing, two-year history. So now where the incorporation works a lot differently than the sole proprietor is, like we mentioned, the sole proprietor is you make the, the the business makes the money and you claim it all personally under your taxes so now for the corporation side of things now the business itself is making the money you have your gross profit you have your net earnings and then you have your retained earnings too so you can choose to keep the money within the business and not necessarily claim a full income so for example what clients generally tend to do is you know throwing random numbers out there just say their business makes 250,000. Um, after all expenses paid, the net profit that they make is 200,000. Now they can choose of that 200,000 how much they want to pay themselves. And this kind of works both ends as well. So if you look at the side of a mortgage application standpoint, the more income you claim, the better. However, you have to pay taxes on that full amount. So what we notice is clients that have incorporations they only claim what they specifically need, one, to either keep up with their general living expenses or two, to, to help get approved for future applications. It's all just a way to, to try and avoid taxes as much as possible, which you can benefit from keeping the money within the business as retained earnings. Okay, so for that particular individual, they have the business, the business makes money, they give themselves an income, um, is the bank looking at the person's individual income to qualify then? Yes and no. So the always, always gray area exceptions are to be made. Uh, so the first stop that we make is we take a look at their personal income. So kind of same scenario, you have $200,000 in net profit. Just say the client only claims 100,000 and the rest is retained earnings, the extra 100,000. So we would go and first use their, their general income to see if they qualify. If the numbers are a little tight and, and maybe just say a little bit above guidelines, that's where there's a gray area where we can use the business income as like a hypothetical situation to show, you know, the client can pull more money out of their business if they choose to do so. However, from a tax standpoint, it really doesn't make sense for them to. So we can use those retained earnings over a two year history to use a hypothetical situation to say, you know, client has the ability, however, it doesn't make sense. So let's use this hypothetical situation to help them get approved. Okay, and is there a, a maximum amount that they're willing to pull from the business income or is that again, totally great? Yeah, always great. Uh, it's really solely based off of the business financials. We essentially do a breakdown of the business financials where we work with what we call our relationship managers. So they're commercial account managers where they can run through the financials to get a good idea of how much could they potentially pull. And that's where we can use it as a hypothetical to our advantage. 
Okay. And in terms of somebody just starting this incorporated business and starting to pay themselves like themselves a salary from that business, are they still looking for a two-year history? Yes, generally two-year history. But again, this is where exceptions can be made. The perfect example is maybe a client might be uh, you know, an IT contractor before. They work for a company, but now it makes sense for them to go self-employed because they're still a contract. They just get paid a little bit differently. So instead of working for that company and getting a T4, they now incorporate they are fully self-employment. Now they can use a lot of their business expenses as write-offs for a tax benefit, all based on having a conversation with your accountant. Uh, and then there we can use that gray area exception to say, hey, they were making X amount before while they were contract work doing the exact same job. Now they just moved to self-employment. Everything's up, keeping up the same because they're still contracted. They're just claiming their income different. So let's get them approved on that basis. Right. And actually, I know of a lot of clients that have done that. They've even been working for the same company and the company says, hey, we can both save some money. Like you go, uh, you know, independent, you get to write these things off and we don't have to pay you for, you know, CPP or Benefits. whatever it is. Yeah. <laughs> things like that. Right. Of course. So exactly, that, that is yeah. uh, that is definitely um, something that I'm seeing more of. And in terms of um, you said so in terms of um what they want to see for income. It's generally two years. What they're looking for down payments is the same. And I'm assuming the credit scores are what is normally required. Yeah, that's all the same. Um, the general score of average 670 or higher. Um, again, a lot of gray area. Sometimes stuff happens with your credit that we can look past. Uh, it's a case by case basis. But uh, essentially, everything's the same in terms of uh, a regular application. It's just the documentation and, and the way that a client claims their income. That's the main thing that changes. Okay. And in terms of the documentation, can you just reiterate what specifically they're looking for for self-employed, uh, sole proprietor versus the incorporated? Of course. So the two-year history for both of them. Well, we'll start with a sole proprietor to make it easier. Um, it's just two years of your personal income tax returns along with your notice of assessments. However, for uh, incorporated, we do need the same thing, the two years of income tax returns along with your notice of, a notice of assessments along with your business financials. So this can be done in the form of either what we call the T2, which is essentially your business corporation tax returns or the notice to reader, which is essentially a big balance sheet going over all the assets, liabilities, uh, incomes, expenses, and shows everything regarding the business. Okay, okay, great. And do you have any tips for uh, self-employed individuals? Absolutely, yeah. When it comes tax time, you, you wanna make sure that you work with your mortgage specialist to see what numbers you essentially need to pull from your business in order to help you get approved. So. It's good that the tax season is, is around the springtime because that's when a lot of home buyers are, are coming into the market. So to speak with your mortgage specialist to say, hey, my business makes X amount. I only need to pull this much to, to keep up with my regular everyday expenses. How much would you suggest if we want to get approved for a mortgage amount of X amount? So we can kind of work on the numbers behind the scenes on paper just to kind of see what amounts that you first of all can claim and how much you may need to claim in order to help you get approved. Okay, great. And in terms of how long it takes for the bank to do a pre-approval uh, for someone who's self-employed, is it longer or the same amount of time as a regular application? Yeah, generally a little bit longer only because sometimes there's exceptions that need to be made. Um, if you have the full two-year history, it's the same process because the numbers are black and white. Every other case, it's a case by case basis. It might take a little bit longer. Sometimes underwriters have a little bit more questions. Um, so generally the same if everything is black and white. Okay, and I'm assuming the interest rate they would get would be the same as the general public as well? Yeah, absolutely. Interest rates will be the same no matter what. The only time interest rates really change is if you're going from an owner occupied or a rental property standpoint. Okay. And the other question that I was going to ask you in terms of the pre-approval process, once uh, BMO issues a pre-approval, how long is that pre-approval good for? Yeah. So our pre-approvals are good for a full six months. Oh, okay. um, 
Very, very long time. Pre-approvals, mm -hmm. yeah, very long time. Uh, even better too is when clients, they just want to know about rates. What rate am I getting? How long can I keep this rate? Especially in a market where rates are consistently changing. COVID is a perfect example is clients were, were jumping into the market when rates are very low. Rates started jumping up uh, over time. Now, where you can benefit from looking at options with BMO is we actually hold the longest rate guarantee on the market, which is a full 130 days. So we can guarantee and lock in your rate for well over four months to give you that comfortability knowing that what you're going you what you are going to get will be for the next four months. It gives you a lot of time to plan, to shop around, to find that right fit for you. Okay, well that that's great. Now, did you say earlier it was six months or did you say the pre-approval is good for six months? The rate itself we can keep for 130 days. Okay, so but how how does that work? If your pre-approval is for six months and you're pre-approved for say, I don't know, 600,000, isn't it based on X amount of, of interest rate? And if the rate was to jump significantly, wouldn't that affect your pre-approval amount? Potentially, and that's why pre-approvals are kind of more like a budget. It's, yeah, <laughs> that's, that's what's <laughs> tough. It's like, yeah, if interest rates just say after that 130 days, jumps you know 5% that could potentially affect your pre-approval right so bmo uh gives you a pre-approval for 6 months saying you qualify for in this case we said 600,000 but at the time we approved you it was for x amount percentage if the rates jump significantly between your 4 month and your 6 month that may affect your pre-approval amount potentially yes okay and the four month period is the rate hold guarantee. So for four months, which is a long time, as long as you purchase a home within the four month period of when that pre-approval was given to you, they guarantee that rate. Yeah, we will guarantee the rate up until that specific date. So 130 days from today. So it's really important to have your mortgage closed by that date, especially in a rate changing environment. Right. And that's one thing too, uh, especially as the rates were increasing uh, the last little bit there. If you buy one day past your pre-approval rate hold, it could mean that you are going to be paying the new rate. So make sure that you are in really clear communication with both your mortgage lender and your realtor to make sure that they put you in uh, a purchase that's going to close. Close is the keyword before the rate expires. That is correct. And it's good because we hold the longest rate guarantee and you're guaranteed the best rate technically on the market. So if rates start to drop during that 130 days, we can just quickly go in there, refresh the 130 days to extend it a little bit longer, just say like a month in, and then get you that better rate as well. Wow, that's great. That's good to know too. So if the rates are dropping, that 130 days gets pushed longer and longer, giving you a little bit more breathing space to take your time to find something if you need to Absolutely. do Absolutely. Always, right. yeah. Okay. And um, if the rate, say you're given a rate uh, and you said that if the rates are reduced, you get that new rate, the new lower rate, and if there's any discount from the posted rate that the bank offers and they give you a discount of something, you would get the new rate plus a discount. Yes, correct. So you're always going to be guaranteed the best rate. Okay, great. That's awesome. And just so that people understand the difference between a pre-approval and a pre-qualification, because there is a huge difference, maybe you can touch on that. Yeah, so pre-approval is essentially, pre we'll look at pre-qualification. Pre-qualification is really just like a verbal conversation between you and your mortgage lender to say, hey, based on your income, based on your debts that you have verbally told me, and based on your down payment, this is the rough purchase price and mortgage amount you could be qualified for. So without us actually going in and doing an application, getting your income documents to confirm, pulling your credit to make sure that everything's satisfactory, that will be a firm pre-approval where based on everything you're, that is true and correct, this is how much you are 100% approved for. Okay. And so the difference too is when you get a pre-qualification, the bank will give you something in writing that you can take to your realtor to show, hey, 
this is my that range. Will be the, <laughs> the, that, that will be the pre-approval where it says, hey, this is right. how much you're approved for, not on this specific property. So that's why condition of financing, I know during the COVID period, very hot topic where people were jumping in with no conditions asked, no matter what. Now with the changing of environments, with the changing of purchase price, because people don't tend, tend to know that the condition of financing includes a satisfactory bank appraisal to make sure that the value matches. So having all of that in, in writing definitely helps. Right. So the pre-approval, which is in writing, is also subject to appraisal. Yes. So essentially what happens is the pre-approval is based off of your income and is based off of the liabilities. That's really it. So now, for example, what if there's a situation where a client goes and, and uh, puts uh, puts an offer in on a house and it comes back $200,000 less. Now, if you're asking for the full 80% loan to value, that's where the bank and the client, there's kind of a mismatch because the bank will only lend a certain amount up until the purchase price, but also the approved or the appraised value. One of the things I think it's really important that home buyers understand is that when they are pre-approved, like you said, they've submitted all of their documents to the bank. The bank has verified their income. They've verified their credit. They verified their down payment. And now the bank says, we are pre-approving you for a purchase price of this amount at this interest rate. And if you're with the BMO bank, we're going to hold that rate for 130 days. Yes. Right. Okay. 130 days, yep. 130 days. Now, it's important that home buyers understand that that pre-approval, even though you have the pre-approval, isn't 100%. It's like a 99%. There's that 1% that would be, I guess, uh, contingent on the property, first of all, appraising, right? Yes, that's correct. So just and making sure that the value of the property matches what the bank is willing to, to loan to. And uh, a great example is, is when COVID, near the end of COVID, which was you know March of this year, where the market specifically was changing drastically, where you know March one month, where the values were super inflated, in my opinion, by April, May, a lot of properties were two to $300,000 less. So a client that might have secured financing at that first in March when the market was really high. Now they're actually doing the appraisal closer to closing in April. That's why it's best to do it as soon as possible. Uh, the value is coming back less. So there's always going to be that. Well, there's going to be a gap in that situation where the bank sees that the value is a lot less. So they might not be willing to lend that full amount as originally talked about when the pre-approval was done. Right. And so does BMO do their appraisals at the time that the buyer is submitting their, their copy of their agreement of purchase and sale during their conditional period? Yes. So the good mortgage specialist will know to do it right away <laughs> okay. to, to kind of make sure that it, it's on par with market, uh, uh, with market conditions. Okay, so the situation that we did experience last year where the kind of the market hit the peak early March and then it kind of started to descend. If those people bought, say, early March, they were pre-approved, the appraisal came in, and then now they're closing last year in June, but now the property is worth less, does BMO go back in and do a re um, a reappraisal or did they base it on the appraisal that was done at the time of the offer? They would have done it at the time of the offer. That's why it's very important to do everything as soon as possible, well before closing to, to kind of eliminate those types of conditions to make sure that the bank is 100% going to back you. Right. And this is something uh, to our listeners out there. I really want to stress and a great point that Kyle brought up. If you're working with a really strong mortgage specialist, they will do all of their due diligence at the time that your offer is going in so that there are no surprises at the end of the day. And people don't understand what implications not doing your due diligence can mean. And that's due diligence on the part of the realtor, on the part of the bank person, and also on the part of you, the buyer, 
you need to make sure that you're submitting all your documents early, that you're getting a pre-approval before you start looking so that your rate can be held. All of these things are really in your best interest because they are going to protect you and they're going to give you your options up front so that you can move forward making you know, strong decisions based on on fact and not just, it could be this, right? It could be, absolutely. Yeah. Better right. safe than sorry, always. Absolutely. Um, anything else that you wanted to share? Uh, no, I think we touched upon all the major points. And of course, the, the main thing I, I want to stress is, especially when it comes to either appraisals, when it comes to self-employment, there's always gray area. And to get in touch with the, with the proper mortgage specialist that has experience in all those gray areas can really make a big difference um, from lender to lender. Right. Okay. And if our listeners do want to get in touch with you, Kyle, what's the best way for them to do that? Yeah, they can give me a call anytime directly at my work number, which is 647-331-8850. Or most clients opt for the email to set up a phone appointment, uh, which is kyle.cole. So that's K-Y-L-E dot C-O-L-E at B-M-O dot com. Okay, that's easy to remember. Thank you so much for uh, sharing your insights with us, Kyle. And uh, to everyone out there, uh, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to Kyle. If you have any um, questions that you would like to see answered in future episodes of our podcast, feel free to reach out to us at realty.bytes.podcast at gmail.com. And, um, you know, uh, maybe we can... Uh, tackle one of your questions in upcoming episodes. If you found this episode insightful, please also subscribe so that you'll get notified of our new and upcoming episodes, which are released every Monday. Thanks for joining us and we will see you next time. Thank you. Thank you.